Welcome everybody um, to the Bucky Clinic Virtual Visiting Professor Series. Um, I am Bob Axafa and, and along with my partners, uh, Greg Bunke, Rudy Buntick, Andrew Watt and Walter Lynn. Um, we're uh, honored this morning to um, have Dr. Nick Haddock um, from the U UT Southwestern Medical Center join us and educate us about his approach to deep flap reconstruction. Um, I uh, met Dr. Haddock actually for the first time last year um, when we were both at the Penn Flap course. Obviously, I'd heard a lot about him, but I hadn't had a chance to meet him in person. Um, and obviously, I saw him give his talk on deep flap e efficiency and, and using um, uh, basically a, a two-team or a multi-team approach and in, in really making these cases as efficient as possible. And it really um, resonated with me because Harry Bunke's entire mantra was always microsurgery with a team approach. And uh, and so, you know, this was one of the many reasons that I thought it'd be great to have him as part of our, our series of virtual visiting pro professors. So thank you for joining us. Just by a um, uh, quick way of background, Dr. Haddock is a native Texan actually, and, and he did medical school at UTMB Galveston, and then traveled back east to do residency at NYU with all of our friends and colleagues from there. Um, and then he traveled south a bit to Philadelphia and he did his hand in microsurgery fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania, which as we know is one of the best fellowships um, around now. Um, and he's been, he's been on faculty at UT Southwestern since 2012. And um, in, in these relatively you know, short eight years or so, he's really um, uh, been known as, as, an, as an expert in all types of microsurgical breast reconstruction um, from deep flaps to other types of flaps, such as pap flaps and lumbar flaps and so on. And he's really assembled a fantastic team where they can do these multi-flap cases in a very efficient way. So Nick, thank you so much for joining us today. It's really an honor to have you. And I know you guys are back up and running, so I know you're pretty busy. So we appreciate you taking the time. Of course. So what, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna find you um, in this list, sorry. Uh, there we go. I'm gonna give you control. You should see a prompt that you've been made presenter. And then at the bottom of your screen, there should be a button that says screen. And if you cl uh, click on that, it should be able to share your desktop. Sorry, give me a second. It's asking for permissions. No worries. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna have to quit it for a second and I'll come right back. No worries, no worries, thanks. All right, everyone. So he'll, Dr. Haddock will be back on in just a minute. And we'll get started. As I was mentioning, the team at UT Southwestern, oh, there we go. That was quick. Yeah, uh, we are back on. Um, you may have to give me presenter again, though, it looks oh, like. Yes, yes, sorry about that. Let's see here, make presenter, yes. There we go. Perfect. Looks great, man. I'm gonna ask right. everyone to please um, mute your microphones and turn your webcams off during the talk so that uh, we don't have any distractions. Thank you so much. Okay, perfect. So um, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, and so as as was stated, uh, you know, some bulk of what I do now is um, Tagus breast reconstruction, certainly all types of reconstruction, but um, kind of what we push the envelope on and, and write about is mainly about autologous. Uh, so I'll talk about uh, optimization efficiency and then kind of an algorithmic approach, uh, especially when we talk about alternative flaps. Uh, we'll kind of go through uh, all of this. Um, so again, uh, when we talk about optimizing deep flaps, uh, efficiency is certainly something that's on the front of our mind. Perforator selection, always uh, important. Um, do we use the SIE? How does that play into it? Uh, and of course, uh, you know, the better we get, we start thinking about the donor sites, avoiding complications, improving the overall experience for patients. And then, you know, it, this is an aesthetic surgery. So the aesthetics certainly matter. And, you know, for our patient's perspective, that's probably number one. They expect the plumbing to work and they care about how they look. Um, and then we'll go through an algorithm for alternatives, specifically focusing on PAPS, LAPS, and then we'll talk a little bit about multi-PLAPS. Um, so let me see if I can make this thing go away because I can't actually see my slide completely. There should be a way to minimize that. We can't actually see it. Um, 
So it's hovering over your screen, but we're, we're okay. Okay, there, I just moved it to the bottom. Um, so in just a general overview of kind of where we come from uh, in thought process and experience, we've done over 1300 deeps in the last eight years. Total success is 98.7 in those. In the last three years, a little bit higher, 99.5. Um, and so, you know, obviously a lot of volume and uh, that's kind of why we've moved to the point of thinking about some of these things. So efficiency, um, you know, how do we get that? And we'll talk about team approach, CTA and how that impacts us and specifically our protocol. Like I said, we'll talk about vas vasculature, uh, picking medial versus lateral. Do we ever take muscle, muscle role for a superficial system? And again, decreasing complications. And then we've implemented an ERAS and talk about uh, how that impacts our, our uh, patients. So why does efficiency matter? Um, so you can look at this from multiple ways, but from a patient's standpoint, we know that faster operations decrease complications, um, less swelling, less fluid, ultimately decrease length of stay. And you know, it, when, when you have a long uh, surgery that again, the primary outcome from a patient perspective is focused on aesthetics. If it takes you eight hours to get to the aesthetic period and you're exhausted, then the nature is, is that people take shortcuts and they just kind of throw it in there and close. And, and that's really doing a disservice to the patient. So if you can get the micro and the, the technical aspects done pretty quickly, then you can focus more on the aesthetics. From a surgeon focused uh, perspective, you know, as simply put, if you can do a bilateral deep pretty quickly, you can do another bilateral deep in the same day or more cases. And I'll kind of show some examples of how we, we manage that. And, you know, those of us that love doing micro, you know, theoretically, we want to do this for a long time. If you're taking 12 hours to do cases, that's hard to do um, because just the nature is it's hard on the body. It's tiring. And, and you know, most people like to be home some and see family and whatnot. Um, for us, uh, getting quicker has certainly led to innovation and in how we think about things. And that's been a lot of our progress in the sense of uh, moving forward. So our recipe, uh, the highlight of really anything is surgical team approach. Um, we're fortunate that we have pretty much the same staff. Uh, we have kind of a core group of circulators and uh, techs, and we work with them nearly every case. And, you know, I, you know, I trained obviously at Penn, so you talk about loop micro, and we do some of that. And big argument for that is, well, we don't have to mess with the scope. It's always a big to-do. There's not a thing that's a to do in our OR. It's a, you know, is the scope right? Yeah, it comes right in. Is the ICG for a spy right? Yeah, the anesthesiologist already has it. Uh, everything's already thought of because we have this team that's done this with us, you know, hundreds of times. Um, from a co surgery standpoint, we do all of our flaps. All of our flaps is a, a co surgery model. Uh, Samit Tiosha and I are partners, and I help him with his patients. He helps me with my patients. Use CTA for everyone number of reasons for that. Uh, one reason is efficiency we'll talk about. I also use it as a counseling uh, method for my patients to give them an idea of their anatomy, how, how complex their specific surgery is, how long I think it will take. And now with you know this virtual these virtual meetings, I'm doing all those virtually. I used to bring them back in. Now I just they go get a CT and, and I pull it up and I go through it with them virtually, which has actually helped out a lot as well. Uh, and then we've really started this process analysis and we'll We'll kind of go through that and I'll show you what I mean by that. So team approach, uh, it's me uh, on the right, on the left picture, and it's me, Tiosha, on the left, us working together. Certainly we have fellows, residents always involved, um, but we always work together. And so we looked at this co-surgery and what was the impact. Um, and generally speaking, decreased operative time, decreased length of stay. Um, we did look at this in the sense of uh, an experience. So, you know, do we get better with time? Sure we do, but we did that with kind of all uh, of these models. Um, and so we have three different groups. SSR is single surgeon. CSR1 is co-surgery with one case. So both of us fully focused on one case. Co-surgery 2, CSR2 is maybe we're doing two deeps on the same day. Maybe we're doing a deep and a couple of expanders. It means people are bouncing in and out. Um, and generally speaking, we shave time. Um, and this is a relatively early experience. We've actually gotten quite a bit faster than this. And just a very rudimentary call savings. This is purely on OR minutes. Um, if you start adding everything else, it's going to be significantly more than that. Um, the other thing that we found, you know, faster again, length to stay, we shaved about one day from length to stay in both of these groups in comparison to the uh, single surgeon. 
So CTA, his paper is coming out in October, was presented at uh, PSRC last year. Um, and basically what we did is we blinded ourselves. One of the advantages of having the co-surgery model is in my patient, I can look at the CT, I can know where the perforators are and I can mark the patient appropriately. And then Teosha is blinded to it and he does the dissection without knowing it. So we can do a pretty well controlled study without potentially compromising care. Um, and so that's what we did here. And basically what we found is if you have a CTA, you find the perforator quicker, right? makes sense. You go directly to where it is. We don't futz around. If it's a lateral perforator, we go directly lateral. We don't even open up mid the midline and, and mess with that. And then same thing with perforator selection. And, you know, if we know there's a dominant perforator and we know there might be another one in row, yeah, we're going to capture it, but we're not going to futz around with even looking at the, con at the other uh, row. So it certainly saves times, and those are both significant, uh, statistically significant. And then, of course, total flap time, uh, harvest time was shortened uh, with that as well, and total operator time uh, was shortened, and these are bilateral deeps. Um, the other thing that was interesting, so how often did we pick the perforator before surgery uh, and, and correlate with that? 74%. Um, and most of that didn't mean that we picked a different perforator. It meant we added a perforator. So when you don't have a CTA, you're a little less confident with your perforator. So you might see, you, when you have the CTA, you can see one, the path through the muscle, but you can also see, does it does it go up in the flap? Does it go lateral in the flap? You, you have a better idea. So you can be a little more confident and maybe uh, select less perforators. Um, so that's CT. And then uh, we started doing this process analysis and um, basically looked at uh, you know a number of consecutive bilateral deeps um, and divided deep flap into simple, a critical kind of the technical maneuvers of the surgery. And certainly this has been done in, in more steps. Um, and this was recently published. And literally what we do is we have a clock on the wall. And we, when we get a knife, we say start and time goes. Um, and uh, so we have eight steps and we'll kind of go through those. Perforator identification is step one, and that's literally getting to the first perf. Uh, step two is perforator decision making. It does not necessarily mean opening the fascia like you see here, but if we have one perforator, it means confirming which perforators are we going to use. Um, step uh, three is perforator dissection. I'm kind of a heavy cautery dissector, um, so I, I tend to try and keep one instrument in my hand and stay with it and, and kind of move that way. So I just put it down on 15 or 12 and, and I'll do a lot of the dissection, especially with a large perforator like this. Uh, I'll do a lot of the dissection with uh, electric cautery. And then step four is pedicle dissection. And, you know, this just means taking all the branches. And most people know all these steps, pretty straightforward. And then harvest, uh, we try and limit our fascial incisions. So we do, um, you know, use retractors to get lower. And we go pretty much all the way down. I know some people short the pedicle. Um, you know, it, we're all in training environments and we typically don't do the micro. And I think you need a little extra length and size and it just makes it easier. Um, as Sir Letty would always say, is uh, you know, make uh, make it macro. Um, flap prep is just the flushing and whatnot on the back table. And then venous anastomosis, we use couplers and pretty standard uh, technique that everyone does. Um, for our arterial anastomosis, we do just two green uh, high fits clamps. Uh, we don't use double opposing and we do kind of this back up. Uh, 180 degree um, or back up and then march around each side. Um, so just putting the clock on the wall, doing nothing else, we shave 73 minutes in operation. And it just shows, and certainly that's been studied in many facets of the world, um, paying attention to time makes you faster. Um, we also looked at, you know, the impact uh, as, or how each individual uh, type of experience uh, and how, how that plays into this. And so certainly we would expect faculty to be faster um, faculty assisted uh, means, you know, basically a resident and faculty doing it together or, or a resident doing it with the faculty assisting. Um, and then the last group is a resident. And that generally means, you know, faculty may not be scrubbed in um, or, or faculty is observing and, and certainly giving, giving uh, guidance. And so obviously you see a big difference in times and that's, that's not unexpected just based on experience. Busy slide, but, you know, again, statistically significant. You can look at the main steps. So perforator, uh, uh, selection, um, you know, experience is going to make that faster. And then the, the probably the hardest technical aspects, perforator dissection and uh, uh, pedicle harvest. So that's step two, three, and four. Those are all statistically significant in all groups. Um, and then total flap harvest time. 
uh, certainly uh, is different. And so when you look at just the faculty group, this breaks it out in the time and how long it takes for each step. And I think one of the ways that we specifically save time, and this again goes to that preoperative planning and, and knowing what we're gonna do. We are at the perforator, have made perforator decision, and are starting the dissection within about 15 minutes on any given case. And um, I, I remember I've been involved in plenty of deeps where you know it's an hour in and you're still you know trying to find the perforator and make a decision. It, ours is 15 minutes, and that's that's pretty common and, and often even less than that. Um, and then if you look at a total, so we get a flap up in less than an hour typically, uh, sometimes much faster than that. But uh, and that means you know we've harvested the flap and then micro is about 34 minutes. Um, and like I said, we we do typically that. Uh, the video showed one person doing micro, but we do typically do that uh, in a group with uh, uh, trainee and faculty. You know, every time we do these bigger BMI patients, we always finish it and feel like it takes longer, but uh, the correlation is not really there statistically. Um, and same thing for flap weight. We thought it would, it feels, certainly feels like it takes longer, but but it actually doesn't really take that much longer. The one of the things that we found that was interesting from this study was uh, how much extra time is in the OR. So when we think about the technical aspects of the operation, those eight steps that I just showed, you know, we we can kind of streamline that and think about that, but then what's going on the rest of this time? And so you see the flap time in blue and the, uh, the orange is the total OR time. So most of the time, you know, a lot of our time is in the total OR time. And this is showing the same thing in a different, different uh, graph. So our flap time average under three hours, our total OR time is uh, a little under six hours. Um, and so, you know, half of our operation is after we've come off of ischemia on our second flap. And that that's kind of dumbfounding when you think about that um, in a sense of we're, we're, we're losing that time somewhere. Um, and so uh, because of that, and when we published this paper, we got some, some, uh, some constructive criticism about not focusing on aesthetics, which we certainly do, um, but the paper didn't. So, uh, we started to look at this in a in, in another way. Um, so we're looking at the entire process right now. Um, we have started doing more loop microsurgery uh, when it makes sense from an efficiency standpoint. So bilateral case, if one rib is not ready and a flap is ready, then we will do the micro with loops. Um, that way you're not bringing a scope in and interfering with the person doing the rib. So it keeps a constant flow. Um, we weren't always as good about positioning to close the abdomen. So now we make a much greater effort to do that. And so uh, just looking at our time, so I look back at 2015, average bilateral deep time was eight and a half hours. This, this year, our average uh, deep time is uh, four hours and 20 minutes. So we've gotten quite a bit faster um, in these cases. And I'll kind of go through, this is the, the latest thing that we've just started doing. So I'm going to show a couple of consecutive cases. And it's a busy graph, but it actually has a ton of information in it. So um, each uh, segment is what we've divided into steps of the operation. So again, recipient site prep, flap harvest, microsurgery, uh, the aesthetics, uh, you know, pedicle AD, up inset closure, and then abdominal closure. And so uh, you can see kind of the flow of the whole case. The colors are individuals. So uh, so I'm green um, and Tio is just purple. Uh, I, I think of him as royalty, so I made him purple. Um, so, uh, so we flow. You can see kind of the flow of the case and how everything goes, and how there are multiple people working at every step. And we've got the abdomen closed well before uh, the second flap is uh, inset, and you know basically the abdomen's you know, almost closed by the time microsurgery is done on the second flap. Uh, in this case, you can see we did do loop micro. Uh, micro was done before the right rib was ready. Um, and so, you know, total time here is three and a half hours. And that's, again, bilateral deep. And it's just the focus on, you know, really keeping the flow of the OR going the entire time. Uh, similar case, uh, I highlight this one. Uh, this was actually the case after that one. So we've done, uh, what, seven or eight of these in a row. And it's pretty labor intensive in the OR to get all these times. Um, so we're going to stop it eventually, but um, but it is interesting. We had to revise two arteries. So on the first flap, we, we did one revision. On the second flap, we did one revision. You would think that adds a lot of time to the case. This case took three hours and 36 minutes. So basically the same time as the one that, that I just showed. The first revision impacted zero. Um, second revision probably added only the time of the actual revision. Um, but if you think about that, usually we think that that's, that's a huge hit to kind of efficiency and flow and, and uh, not always. 
Um, just another example of this. Uh, this was our third case to doing this, and again, three and a half hours. Um, I talked about doing more in a day. Um, so this was Tuesday, actually, of this week. And so uh, you can kind of see um, what what is possible when you start getting quicker times and and um, and efficiency and when you have this team approach and you see more colors. Uh, we do have the luxury right now of while we're back to full steam, not everyone's back to full steam. So Tiosha and I are, are pretty busy, but uh, not everyone is, is running at the same uh, pace yet. Um, and so we have a lot of residents that are helping um, and that certainly helps. So uh, our first case was a bilateral path. Uh, we finished that in a little under three hours and we went to a second room and started a bilateral deep, um, finished that in a, a little under four hours. And then I had two other cases. So I did a unilateral TE and then a bilateral implant. Um, and that's all in a given day, finishing by 4.10. So it's a nine hour day, but 7 a.m. start, um, not so bad. And that's a pretty productive day. Um, and so that's what I meant when I said, you know, if you can get quicker, you can do more in a day and it allows you to still get home at a reasonable time. Um, so that's kind of the efficiency. Um, and, you know, all that is only possible with the team. Um, you know, like I said, Dr. Tiosh, Sumit Tiosh and I work together all the time and, and we both kind of push each other in, in these aspects. Um, so vasculature. Certainly that's a critical aspect of deep flaps. How many perforators, which ones do you take muscle? How do you choose? And so um, this is our data. Uh, medial row is the most common, 47%, lateral row, 32%, um, and then uh, interesting multiple rows in about 20%. Um, we take two perforators, the most common, uh, 44%, and then one perforator, about 32%. Um, do we do things other than deeps? We do, but not very often. Um, MS trams, uh, 2% and SIEs. I hate SIEs, um, 2%. Tiosha likes to do SIEs a lot more than I do. And I, I generally try and talk them out of it. Um, but most of what we do are deeps. Um, so, uh, we looked at this, one of our re residents, Austin, a uh, great resident we have, uh, did a great study on this. And basically what we found was lateral row alone or, uh, or with a lateral row plus a medial row reduces fat necrosis. And that makes sense. And that's what most people would agree with because lateral row is gonna support more of the lateral flap. Um, adding a lateral row is better than adding an additional medial row. So again, kind of that same thought process, but it's a trade-off. So lateral row does increase the bulge rate. If you're, critic if you, if you're honest with your results and, and look at your patients and talk to them, a lot more patients get, maybe it's a small bulge, it's not a hernia, but, but a lot more patients get these than, than more we actually are honest about. And so we do a lot of effort to preserve nerves, but still um, people do get bulges and lateral row has been shown to, to increase that. So what does that mean? Uh, it doesn't really answer the question. So standard criteria for us, uh, we want a relatively large vein, ideally visibly pulsatile, palpable. That's the perfect situation. If multiple perforators in the same row, then we do include them. But you have to keep in mind your lower perforators will decrease your working pedicle length and um, and we try and limit uh, nerve damage. So if there's a tiny perforator that's low and there's a big muscular nerve going in between those two, we are likely not to take that lower perforator. Um, but, you know, it, it's a judgment call and that's an experience thing. And I think we all continue to learn and, and be humbled by by this operation. Um, and so, you know, here, pretty straightforward. You see a sensory nerve, but we don't see a motor nerve. If you have these two perfs, we're taking those. It's going to add zero to that. Your zero time to the operation. They're spread out. They're in the exact same row. It's going to damage no muscle. Uh, that's kind of a no-brainer. Gets a little more complicated when it gets like this, and those perforators aren't as big. Um, you've got you know one that's either medial or an intermediate, and then these other two, um, and this muscle in between. And this is when it becomes a judgment call and. And it's kind of uh, more of an experience thing. And, and we are not a big uh, high pitch clamp and spy group. Um, we have done that, but we, we generally don't. Uh, in my opinion, when you look at these two, if you take those two perforators in the same row, they're spread out pretty well. They're probably going to perfuse uh, the entire flap. Uh, what about the role of the SIE? Um, so we're, we're, we've looked at this. And so with a, a thousand consecutive flaps, how many SIEs did we do? It was about 30. Um, what was our flap loss rate? Uh, it was close to seven. That's in my mind, that's unacceptable. And what was uh, fat necrosis? How many uh, how many of these flaps had fat necrosis? 50%. To me, that's an unacceptable, 
you know, a choice um, when you look at those numbers. And I know a lot of people do SAEs and love them and, and say they're perfect, but uh, it certainly doesn't damage the abdominal fascia, but, uh, but I'm not willing to accept those rates. Uh, we will do uh, dual plane flaps, uh, you know, uh, dual pedicle flaps, and, and we've done, uh, we've probably done more than 21 now, but, um, but uh, in those, it's a little more complicated because uh, you're, you're doing a little bit more micro, but uh, zero flap loss rate in, in our experience and the fat necrosis rate does decrease. And um, so again, I, I think fat necrosis, we aren't always as honest with those results um, in, in general. Um, compared to our deeps, which is about 13%, uh, adding that SIE as a secondary vessel uh, does decrease it. Um, so again, dual plane, what does that mean? Uh, and this is, a, this is a, a perfect example of a dual plane and when, when it's indicated. So here you see a deep, you see the cranial extension with the high fits clamp on it, and let's spy it. And oh, lateral flap is completely dead. Um, and so we knew this was gonna happen. Um, and uh, you'll see why in a second. Um, but so that entire lateral flap is not perfused. Um, so what we, we did was uh, we hooked up the SIE, which happened to be lateral to that area, um, into the cranial extension. Um, and sometimes we do that on the abdomen, sometimes we do it on the chest. Um, and then, so this is why, so we did this one on the abdomen, and this is why you can see it, those uh, dotted lines, that's a scar. So she'd had a previous insert, uh, surgery. So there, there was no uh, perfusion past that scar. Um, and then the uh, spy after um, uh, connecting it, you can see the deep and the SIE, and there you see the lateral extent of the flap. And so uh, that allows us to uh, incorporate, it's basically two, two flaps if you think about it, because uh, there was no perfusion past that kind of gray line you see there. Uh, so uh, moving on, decreasing adverse events, complications. Um, so SPY, I've shown a couple images of that. Um, this is a, another, uh, this is a paper that's coming out in October, looking at our experience with SPY and we're not, you know, we have no, uh, I didn't say this at the beginning, I have no disclosures, no conflicts of interest. Um, and so it, we're, um, we're this kind of a pure SPY study without, without, you know, saying we're funded by anyone. Um, and we like to spy, and so uh, 506 deeps, uh, again, 13% fat necrosis rate, and uh, we used spy in 200 flaps, and uh, basically showed that we decreased fat necrosis from 16% to 8.5. Uh, what was interesting is we also resected less volume, so um, without spy, we're resecting more of the flap and still having a higher fat necrosis rate. Um, so, so we we do use it, uh, and we mainly use it after we've plugged in the flap on the chest. Uh, burden of fat is another thing that I think is underappreciated. Um, so, uh, you know, 0.69 revisions related to fat necrosis, 1.22 more imaging studies. Um, so we actually looked at uh, not just our visits, we looked at uh, visits to the oncologist, medical oncologist, visits to the surgical oncologist. They had 0.77 more biopsies, 1.7 additional oncologic office visits. That's a significant burden to the patient, not only uh, time, financial, but think about the stress load. You got a cancer patient, now they've, they're getting, you know, another one biopsy after they've had cancer surgery purely because they have fat necrosis. So that's not a nothing um, when you think about this. And so uh, the more we can do to limit fat necrosis, I think is very critical. Um, the other thing we've done uh, uh, recently in the sense of trying to limit, you know, bad outcomes is we started really looking at our abdominal closure protocol. And so we put together a simple seven step protocol. And most of these things, uh, people do. Um, we just made a point to do all of them. So uh, limit uh, central subscarpal fat excision. Uh, we triple point the umbilicus, um, abdominal flap uh, uh, perforator preservation, uh, limited central abdominal flap elevation. We always wash out the abdomen, thing, but easy to overlook. Um, we always do uh, recognize can you, can you please turn your microphone off? Yeah, please turn your microphone off. I'm trying to find you in the list. Thank you. Sorry, Nick. No worries. Um, we always do rectus plicate. So we always do that. Again, this is cosmetic operations. So we always are treating it like we would for a tummy tuck. And then we started excising uh, uh, the umbilicus. And we'll kind of talk through that specifically. Uh, higher VMI. Uh, when we look at the CT, that's another advantage of going over the CT with the patient is I'll look at the CT. And I'll say, you see how high your umbilical stalk is? It's four centimeters, five centimeters. Can you imagine the blood flow once we take everything out? And you know it kind of makes sense to them once you say it that way, and they actually agree. And, and my classic line is, "Well, you know, angels don't have uh, uh, belly buttons, and neither does Barbie." So um, generally, people feel pretty good about that. But uh, umbo hernia is the other thing that we do. Um, we'll we'll remove it. Um, so 
pretty standard limited central undermining, perforator of abdominal wall, if you can pr uh, preserve that. Umbo, we studied this as well. Um, and Jung, uh, is another one of our residents, she's graduating, going to MB Anderson uh, for fellowship this, uh, next year. Um, and basically this is kind of looking at the positive likelihood ratio of stalk length versus having a complication um, in the uh, abdomen. And so we say, you can see it's progressively going up, but certainly once you get above three centimeters, 3.5 centimeters, it's, it's much higher. Um, and just just paying attention again to these, you know, handful of steps, uh, you can we at least decreased our abdominal complications, and that that's one of the hardest things in this operation is that managing the abdomen afterwards. And um, so basically, you can see in our experimental group, um, which wasn't really an experimental group except for the only thing we truly changed was adding the excision of the umbo, and we just made sure we did all those other things every single case. Um, but we, you know, reduced our, uh, any wounds, minor wounds, had no major wounds, uh, in this group. So significant. So when we removed the umbo, um, uh, so this paper is also coming out. We did a little video on this. When we remove it, we'll do umbilical reconstruction. So, um, that is, uh, how we do it. It's a little flap. We tuck down a little skin graft and you can do, you know, certainly there are a number of protocols that are. Uh, described in the cosmetic literature, but many of these patients are thicker than your standard abdominoplasty patient. So sometimes you need a flap to really tuck down. And this is that patient. Um, so you can see, we didn't give her that vertical scar. That was, she had a spine surgery in between things, but um, you can see her umbo looks pretty natural. Um, and that's a reconstruction, of course. Um, so it's, I think sometimes they look better than, uh, uh, you'll see in our other results. I think they look better than our other results. Uh, so I, I kind of like doing this. Uh, ERAS, certainly everyone's, not everyone, but most, most people are starting to do this to do a high volume, especially with deeps. And so it's a multimodal approach. We do uh, a lot of it's counseling and just telling the patients, you know, you're going to go home after two days. Um, and so we do a COX-2 inhibitor, we do gabapentin, uh, people are getting uh, Tylenol. Um, and then uh, in the OR, um, you know, we're, we are doing the lidocaine uh, bolus and the lidocaine drips. Um, and then, you know, trying to maintain, you know, some hypotension, but once we're done with micro, we let them come up, trying to keep the euvolemia. Uh, we're big on paralysis, um, kind of standard stuff, but just protocol, protocolizing everything. Um, and then uh, post-op, they're on gabapentin, um, clear liquids are started day one or day zero and, and advanced. Uh, many people, many patients eat the night of surgery. Uh, regular food, and then they're out of bed either that evening after surgery or the next day, depending on how fast it is, of course, DVT prophylaxis. Um, we did incorporate uh, liposomal pupivacaine, tap blocks. We do them ourselves uh, in the OR with the abdomen open. We get an ultrasound out and, and we do it ourselves. And that has also uh, changed experience for our patients. So uh, when I first started, uh, my, my length of stay was five days. Um, for a bilateral deep. And so with time, you can see just getting better, getting faster, um, it started coming down and, and really kind of plateaued around uh, three and a quarter, three and three quarter days. Um, and so that was 2015 on. And, and, and so then we started changing things. And so we added uh, um, the ERP or the ERAS, and then we added the ERP plus Expiril. And so if you look at these two groups uh, before, prior to, uh, this is immediately prior. So it's a pure, pretty pure data in the sense of uh, time of surgery and whatnot. Um, so pre-ERP, we had a length of stay at 3.6 days. Just adding the ERP, we dropped down to 3.2. Adding the ERP plus Expiril, we dropped down to 2.6. All statistically significant. Um, and then, of course, uh, hot topic everywhere is uh, opioid uh, consumption, and same thing happened. Um, so decrease, decrease, decrease. Um, so all of those things are going to make a better experience for the patients. I, it's what is shocking to me is I will routinely round nowadays with Expiril and uh, the ERAS. I round the next day after surgery, and the patients will literally say, "I have no pain," and it just dumbfounds me that we do this massive operation and and it's a pretty common uh, response that we get uh so we'll switch gears to aesthetics and kind of go through this certainly and no breast reconstruction uh talk is complete without talking about aesthetics um so uh we talk about uh volume projection footprint um uh, uh the skin envelope symmetry scar pattern nipple position those are kind of the things i think about and certainly 
Uh, I, if, you know, for residents, uh, if you haven't read the, the series by Blondiel uh, for breast reconstruction, this is how I have always thought about it, um, but it certainly uh, shapes it out. So footprint, um, the base of the breast, uh, kind of non-negotiable uh, in a sense. Um, you can certainly do fat grafting to potentially help with that, but um, you, you have to give that. Uh, the conus is probably something that you can negotiate a little bit more. Again, with uh, volume, you can add fat grafting. Uh, you know, plenty of people will do an implant under a flap to give more volume. Um, so that you can uh, manipulate a little bit more other than your flap. But skin is probably the most non-negotiable. If you don't give the patient enough skin during a flap, um, then you can't fix that later. Um, and so... Uh, with an ideal situation, this is easy. Um, this is a, a bilateral uh, nipple sparing mastectomy, um, you know, relatively uh, full abdomen. Um, and so my typical thought process is uh, most of the time contralateral, but not always. Uh, so a hemi flap goes up to the chest. Um, we can uh, take off kind of the corners to shape, and then we'll do a subscarpal resection cranially to help it taper off. Um, and so that's kind of a, a typical uh, nipple sparing result. Her scar comes up a little bit high and don't look at her abdomen or she, her scar looks horrible on the abdomen. Um, but generally speaking, that's a pretty straightforward operation because the patient starts off pretty well. Um, we'll kind of flip through those. Um, another similar similar situation, um, you know, not, not that big where you get enough tummy and matches pretty well to what she did preoperatively. Um, so, you know, it, instead of just showing, you know, good, good results, let's talk about some mistakes. And unfortunately, not all these patients are mine, um, but at least uh, some poor results. And so this is not my patient, but um, this is from uh, Parkland, our county hospital. Um, and so, you know, just to look at this and you know, in the old days, you know, you, you finish this case and you high five and, and everyone's happy because it's a success, but you really haven't solved the problem completely. So you don't have enough volume, don't have enough skin. Some patients don't. So it's easy to say, well, I'll just lift the left side. Some people don't want that. So some patients don't want to look more cosmetic. They want to look like they did before they had cancer. Um, and so it is our job to, to try and figure out what our patients want and provide that for them. So this patient's not gonna have symmetry. She's never gonna have symmetry without, without giving her scars on the left. And the scar is in a really high medial unfavorable location. Now that may have been unavoidable based on you know history, um, but just from a critical uh, standpoint. Um, this is another, not my patient, but um, I think the surgeon probably did a uh, extended uh, you know, deep or abdominal base flap um, but probably could have done a full double flap. Um, so still not enough skin, certainly you could reduce the right side, but even so not enough skin, not enough volume. Um, and so no symmetry and again, a high scar and you notice there's no projection. And I suppose you could put an implant underneath this and that, that would probably help. Uh, this is my patient. Um, so this is one of my first, uh, early on deeps and, um, so patient had a history of uh, lumpectomy and radiation, having a uh, recurrence, and um, we uh, did left breast reconstruction, and, and you know, it's not a good result. Um, and so I, there's no question I should have uh, done a double deep, and that's what I would do now if I saw this patient. Um, but we didn't, so we did not provide enough volume. I didn't even correct the notching. That is uncorrectable at this point without another flap. Um, because you need skin there. So in this uh, notching goes up into the eye. Can you can y'all see my cursor? Uh, yes, we can see it. Okay. So in the notching that goes up into the axilla, you cannot correct that without giving more skin. So theoretically, we should have gone much higher. Um, I think I draw that out here. Um, yeah. So nowadays, I would give much more skin, give her much more ptosis um, and more volume. And and honestly, we'll talk about multi flaps, but. I would fall much more into let's make her bigger than she needs to be from us and just to capture the skin and then we can lipo liposuction that down and tailor it and that's more of the approach now um so this is another one of my patients um you know mastectomy outside failed te and, and showed up for breast recon actually sent her to me for paps um but um you know the paps are great but they're the one the one surgery that gives you the most skin is a is a double deep by far um so that's what i decided to do did a left uh, mastopexy and so you think about it we have to replace all that skin and give her volume and double deep was the right operation and overall a success 
but I, I could have done better. And so um, you can see that football shape uh, scar. We could have avoided that, no question. Just bring the scar a little bit lower. Seems funny, cut out more skin, um, but it, it would have hidden the scar. And so a, from a visible standpoint, you wouldn't see that lower scar. She just had the scar on the top. She's a horrible scar former, so she's hypertrophic everywhere, but at least you wouldn't see that scar. Um, and so we certainly could have done that better in lowering that scar. Um, so uh, reasonable result. Uh, this is kind of classic mastectomy. And fortunately, she heals incredibly well. She never did a uh, nibble recon or, um, or tattoo or anything on her breast. Um, but she has this kind of transverse scar. And so one of the things that I've moved uh, away from greatly is doing that. Instead, now I try and focus on a vertical scar. And I think that's changed the results to look more like a breast reduction um, or a cosmetic mastopexy type operation um, to have these vertical scars um, instead of the transverse. And so that's that's my preference now. Um, I'm gonna switch gears to uh, kind of our algorithmic approach, but I, I the, the one negative of these, I love the Zoom and these go-to uh, go meetings and whatnot, um, but it does make it difficult for it to be interactive. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions if, if um, or we can do questions at the end. Um, and, yeah, so there are there are a number of questions in the comment section to me directly, but I'll just ask them at the end. Uh, so okay. yeah, go ahead and keep going. Yep. All right. So I'll keep going. Um, okay. So uh, this we just had this uh, kind of mini series come out in PRS Go, um, and so this is our kind of approach to breast reconstruction. And we really started to focus on patient centric uh, flap selection. And so what flaps do we do? Deeps, anyone who does breast recon, flaps, deep, uh, you know, abdominal base can be your number one. So historically, 76% of our flaps are, are deeps, 17% paps, and, and then 1.3% are laps. But if we look at, oh, so, and then who, how do you pick? Um, you know, pap people are shaped differently. And it's as simple as that. You look at the patient, where do they have excess tissue? Where can you get it? Um, you know, what? what is gonna contour their donor site better and provide enough volume uh, for breast reconstruction. And so you can kind of see the idea that PAP patients tend to have more, more tissue on their thighs, whereas lumbar patients tend to have more truncal uh, uh, excess uh, tissue. Um, if you look at more recently, that, that, uh, that has changed a bit. Um, so 2019 is when we first, we, our first lumbar was at the very end of 2018. Um, so in 2019, 13% uh, of our flap-based practice was lumbar artery flaps. Um, and so the only thing that really decreased was deeps. And I don't, I don't think the number actually decreased. Um, it just proportionally decreased. Um, and so here you can see that, again, uh, kind of the evolution of abdominally-based, you know, 2013, uh, not very many thighs. Thighs certainly increased over time. And then... Uh, uh, more recently, we added a, a whole new flap um, in 2019. Um, so what about uh, other alternatives? You know, so S-gaps, uh, I-gaps, any gluteal flap, you know, if you look at half the meetings that we all go to, and, you know, I, what, there was one online meeting I just looked at um, recently, and there was like two hours for reconstructive surgery, and then there was like a full day for buttock contouring. So certainly, Certainly, it's not favorable right now. So people don't want to have a shark bite out of their buttocks. So we we pretty much never do these. We have, but it's way down on the list of options. Uh, tug flap, to me, is inferior to the PAP for a number of reasons. One is scar placement. The other is the pedicle is short and the perforators are small um, and the potential for lymphatic harm. Um, the uh, I have done I don't really do tugs but there are a handful of patients that I have been set up for a pap and on imaging you see this massive uh, medial circumflex perforator and so I have done uh, some actually tug perforator uh, flaps um, and at least that helps with uh, pedicle length um, but again I I don't preference it. Um, and then uh, LTP, so this patient I actually have on the schedule for next week. Um, she's like a perfect LTP patient because she's got this lateral uh, excess. And so we don't do that many LTPs, but when this patient walks in the door, um, kind of makes sense. So, and that's, that's the area she is complaining about, it makes the most sense to take tissue from there. Um, so we're gonna do that. Uh, so, you know, much of life is luck and kind of seeing an opportunity and jumping on it. So Bob Allen, uh, 
uh, certainly one of my mentors uh, at NYU, uh, not there anymore, but when I was there, um, did the first pap flap during live surgery in Mexico. Um, so he's he's obviously an excellent perforator flap surgeon, um, and he was not planning on doing a pap. He thought he was doing an in, uh, in the crease eye gap perforator instead of going up to the gluteal, actually went down, and the pap flap was born for breast reconstruction. Um, so that was the first one. I was the chief resident at NYU at the time, and when he came back from that trip, uh, all of a sudden, I don't know how he how he does this, but all of a sudden he had like fifteen of these things booked. Um, so I did the first 27 uh, pap flaps with him um, by pure luck uh, that I was on service at the same time. And so I, when I graduated as chief resident, I had more experience with pap flap breast reconstruction than, than most people, um, which was fortunate. Um, and then uh, certainly have uh, run with that as best I can. So uh, in my experience, so since I got to uh, uh, UT Southwestern, I've done a little under 300 of these. Uh, 150 patients, um, and we have about a 98% success rate with these. Our success is a little bit lower than in these flaps, and I don't think it's a problem with the flap. It's that often we do these flaps uh, in stacked situations, and the ones we typically lose are the buried flap that we plug into the caudal internal memories, and and you know we we catch it late um, and and lose it. So not an unacceptable success rate, but something that we're constantly thinking about trying to improve. And so PAP, front artery perforator, uh, the vessel runs through the adductor magnus, um, variable path, um, but this is kind of a pretty classic uh, path for the vessel. Um, and so it's more central for, for the thigh and more central for kind of the bulk of what most people have in their thigh for a flap in comparison to a tug or gracilis perforator. Um, so indications in our series, most of these patients are thin, 43% under, that's thin and, and maybe not thin where y'all are, but thin in Texas, 43% um, uh, under um, 25. Um, abdomen uh, not available secondary to uh, previous surgery, typically abdominal plasty in 22%. And like I said, we do, we, we do include these in, as an adjunctive source or double PAPs, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, flaps are typically 401 grams, pedicle length about 11. Typically one perforator, sometimes two, um, and typically perforators about one to 1.5 millimeters. Um, so uh, early on, we were doing all of these prone, um, which you know adds a complexity to the operation. Um, we did this imaging study uh, looking at CTs and MRAs and perforator location and found there's a cluster of perforators immediately. That allowed us to flip and start doing these operations supine, um, which certainly changes the entire operation. Uh, uh, we did, uh, this was uh, Kern Wong, who's now in, um, in Denver, um, but she had worked with Sancir on a number of these um, injection studies, so she actually helped us with this. Um, and just an injection study, uh, an uh, anatomic study where we uh, dissected out kind of the entire thigh area and with the pap perforators and injected them and then did CTs um, to look at the perfusion. And these always underestimate perfusion. Um, but basically this said, and this is at least would justify why people do BPAPs or the vertical PAP. I don't preference that, but it does give significant perfusion in the vertical uh, dimension um, uh, from these perforators. Um, and so we've written kind of two papers, uh, 101 and then more recently 265 um, uh, series. And I'll kind of go through that um, in kind of these things, incision planning, marking and inset, recipient alternatives, uh, and, and whatnot, I'll just kind of go through each one. Um, so imaging is critical for all our patients, as I said already, uh, and PAP specifically, it does a couple things. Um, it, knows, it lets us know where the perforator is, and that does dictate how we uh, design the flap. There are some patients that you have to go lower than the gluteal crease, um, and in those patients, uh, I, again, I like to counsel the patients. If they have a low perforator, I'm looking at the CT, I'll say, look, your perforator is low, it's your anatomy. That's why your scar is gonna be visible. It's not because not because I don't like you and I wanna give you a visible scar, or not because I'm not a good surgeon, it's because your anatomy, and that really helps. Also, same reason, um, if the perforator is low, then I'm more likely to bevel in the thigh, um, which, is, which is helpful to know. Um, and then it tells you when to slow down. So I typically go pretty quickly up to uh, the adductor. And if the perforator is real superficial in the adductor, then you know you need to get, get slow pretty quick. Um, and so we'll go through that. So marking, uh, this is an early marking. Uh, I showed her result earlier uh, from 
from a breast standpoint. Um, I think I did, um, or I will. Um, uh, but anyway, so height is about six to eight centimeters based on perforated location and pinch. Well, I don't mark like this anymore. These incisions are very lateral. Uh, now I mark like this, so I'll stop it in the gluteal crease. And I think that ultimately gives a much better result um, in hiding the scar. Um, and so here I mark the patients uh, the morning of surgery immediately before. This is all I do for marking. Um, and so, you know, sometimes we put them in underwear for comfort um, and then a little beveling. And that's it. I don't mark the front preoperatively. I think that's obviously very uncomfortable. So when they get to the OR, this is what they look like. We frog leg them. I typically do the dissection from the contralateral side. I'll complete the markings that go right up to the adductor longus. Um, I, people talk about stirrups and lithotomy, and I, I have done that. I tend to be a surgeon that, I, in my perfect world, I have two cauteries when I do this operation. I have a hot one and I have a cold one. I have an Atsin and probably a tenotomy and a bipolar, and that's really all I need other than some retractors. Um, and I tend to set all that right in front of me, and you can't do that with stirrups and lithotomy, and it becomes a mess, and I, I tend to drop things. Um, so some people like it. I don't. Um, so I do it from contralateral. And so here's a... Uh, an example of a typical pap uh, harvest. Uh, you're gonna make your skin incisions. Um, uh, like an SIE, we do always dissect out a transverse branch. You don't see it in this patient, unfortunately, but um, most patients have a transverse branch of the saphenous. Um, I've never had to use it, but um, you know, I like bailouts. So I've lifted the gracilis, we've retracted it out of the way. We're opening the fascia over the adductor magnus. There's your perforator. Um, and so this is when it becomes a judgment call. The adductor is a pretty large muscle. Um, and so I will at least split some of the adductor around the perforator. And depending on how superficial that muscle is, or the perforator is, I will start elevating the adductor off of the perforator or I will split it. So if it's very superficial and, you know, centimeter of muscle, then I'll, I'll probably just split it. And so I split it here for a little ways and then it starts getting thicker. The perforator dives down into the muscle. And so at that point, um, you're going to see I'm a change point. So I place two Gelpies, self-retaining retractors. I like Ragnell's to lift. There are always branches that go posterior, go deep, and go uh, superficial. That's what gets you into trouble. Um, so you have to really watch those. I have now dropped the rest of the adductor down, and I'm going above it. And so I refine that, that pedicle, and I'll take it all the way up to uh, the profunda. Um, and you can see the, the veins always get big. The, the veins are uh, always adequate size. Artery sometimes is a little bit of a mismatch, um, but uh, the veins are veins are sometimes bigger than the mammaries, um, certainly on the left side. So here you can see I've isolated that. that, And then uh, we typically go ahead and cut. We control our vessels and go ahead and uh, um, cut them. Uh, and I'll place a clamp on the vessel and then we finish the lateral dissection. Um, and I find this much safer because uh, then you have the pedicle right in your hands and you're looking at it. Um, and you can do your dissection laterally. I typically will jump uh, into the fat. You see I'm starting to get out. There is some posterior nerves, um, so you want to watch out for those. Um, that's a typical uh, flap. And so when bringing up the chest, this is my preferred way of inset. So it's a coned, and it's coned caudally. Um, so it looks like this. Um, this was my very first pap, and it went great, and I was real happy. And uh, then I had to fat graft her multiple times afterwards, and I still never fixed up. Uh, problem. So it's subtle, but there's a little indention laterally. Um, and that's because I coned her like that instead of the way that I just showed. And, you know, that's really hard to fix, if not impossible to fix. Um, I, I probably fat grafted her three times and could not get that to come out. Um, so, uh, you know, avoid it in the first place is much easier. So typical pap. Uh, this is the patient I showed earlier um, with the scars that are a little bit wide. Um, you know, it, I actually show her results to patients all the time because I don't think her scars look that great. Um, and I think that's uh, helpful to give people a realistic idea. Um, but the scars do go pretty wide. Um, contours improve, but scars are certainly visible. Another patient, uh, bilateral uh, PAPS, nipple reconstruction. Um, her scars go wide, but she's a great healer. Um, so it's, you know, it's interesting. It's, you know, most of this genetic and how people heal, um, same operation, but uh, her scars are much less visible. Um, this is a patient that had previous uh, lymphoma and mantle radiation and then had a uh, lumpectomy, positive margins. And so she's much tighter on the left side from all of this. And so we did a delayed immediate approach. And so I dropped her with an expander or purposely um, so and overexpanded that IMF on the left, and then we came back and did PAPS um, via the IMF, and uh, you know, overall a, a pretty good result. Um, 
And so here you can see the scar. The scar is actually lower in this patient, but it's almost less visible because it doesn't go lateral. Um, another bilateral pap, nipple sparing. These are all pretty typical patients, pretty thin. Again, same thing, scar doesn't go lateral, so you almost don't see it at all. Uh, immediate pap, um, so nipple sparing, immediate. Uh, young patient like this, these can be pretty challenging to get to the mammaries. So you can certainly go lower on the mammaries. Fine on the right side, left side can be a little bit challenging. We elected to go to the serratus, uh, which we don't do that often. Uh, serratus actually matches the pap artery pretty well. Um, and so this is immediate. You can see the thoracodor or subscapular system, serratus branch. Um, and so we plugged in a uh, pap into that and as a single surgery. Um, she looks lateral, uh, but but she looks lateral pre-op. So pretty similar, but she's had zero revisions. Um, uh, her scar's a little bit low also, but um, uh, probably acceptable. Um, so we look at uh, uh, wounds, of course, that is one of the problems with PAPs. And um, there is uh, you know, a significant number of patients that have a minor scab, um, you know, 24%. Um, so that's not a small number. So we certainly counsel our patients uh, in that regard. Um, and many of them need you know, a little uh, you know, hand-holding to get through that. Um, but very few have you know, a, real, uh, a real problem. But there is a, a you know, higher rate of, of actual problems than when we're comparing to other uh, flaps. So wound dehiscence, uh, 13%. Uh, that's patient-based, not flap-based. Um, and of course, when you look at that, what's one of the biggest uh, reasons is certainly BMI. Um, that's the same as kind of everything we do. Um, so our current data per patient, uh, thigh wounds, about 12%. Um, and then 6.3% uh, if we uh, look at donor thighs. Um, and then infections, 8%. You know, it's, uh, it's unfortunate, but it's not uncommon when we get to that lateral extent of the thigh, we're rolling it over and doing the lateral extent, we see the back of the table. Um, and, you know, it's just the draping is, is never perfect and it's a hard area to drape and it's not the cleanest area. Um, so I think infection rates are a little bit higher. Fortunately, typically it's just PO antibiotics and they get better. Um, so what about, uh, you know, the donor site when the patient doesn't like it? So she was a, a pretty good result for her breast. Uh, she hated her donor site and she didn't really have much of a buttock contour preoperatively. And she felt like I elongated it, um, and made it look worse. And she was pretty unhappy with it. So, um, what we did was, uh, we did kind of this Ryan, you know, in the, in the idea of a Ryan flap, like a inframammary reconstruction, um, where we de up tissue and tucked it in and, and uh, you can see it here in the schematic, um, you know, pre and post op and basically what we did and bring that skin up. And, you know, it certainly doesn't look like she did preoperatively, um, but it looks better than the middle photo. Um, you know, but it certainly changed. Some people would argue maybe it looks better, um, but, but it does look different. So it's something to think about for these patients. Um, the other thing is function. So do we hurt the thighs? Um, uh, so, you know, we did this as a typical orthopedic uh, uh, functional scale for, for more orthopedic uh, uh, reasons. But so we implemented this in PAPS and basically what we found, um, so the, the highest is 80 and a drop down to 71 is uh, anything below 71 is considered significant. Um, and so by three months, we're still below that number. Um, but by six months and, you know, on, we're back to a normal um, level. I've had one, one PAP patient that ran a half marathon at three months post-surgery. Um, that was actually the first one I showed, um, but she was pretty uh, aggressive. And that's the problem with PAPs. A lot of the patients is that they are, they're the yoga patients. They're the runners. They're the, they, they're the ones who you have to hold back. In contrast to deeps, sometimes the deeps are trying to get up and get moving. Fat patients, you you have to tell them, please don't stretch your thighs, and and that's more of the issue. But but they do get back to normal function and, and generally do pretty well. Um, so this is a typical PAP, that same uh, schematic that I showed earlier. Um, so uh, a little under three hours. It doesn't always go that fast, but it is it is typically faster than our deeps. Um, our average, I would guess, is is under five hours. Um, you know, all all time and probably typically around four hours or less. Um, but you can see kind of the flow of things. And one of the great things about the PAP is the thigh is closed uh, and the thigh doesn't really impact anything else in the sense of closing. So um, you can just close whenever you're done. Um, and so I'll skip that, we'll talk about question then. So we'll switch, switch gears. How much time do we have time? I didn't realize it's already already uh, an hour. We, we, have, we have plenty of time. This is great. Okay. 
All right, so go I'll for keep, it. keep going. Um, so I just have two more kind of uh, sections. I've got lumbar and then I've got multi-flaps. Um, so lumbar flaps, this is our series. We've done 38 and 19 patients. Um, we've had two, <laughs> unfortunately, you, know, you, you find a new flap and things go great. And you want it to go well and you don't want to have a 90% success rate, but that's kind of where we are. Um, and unfortunately, um, one of our flap losses was a protein C patient and the, one of these patients that we took back, her artery went down, what, day three, which never happens. And um, we took it back, we saved it, and we put her on heparin, and she was on heparin for another three days and, and two hours after we stopped the heparin and, and hoped to bridge her to Lovenox, uh, flap went down again and we couldn't save it. And turns out she was a protein C disorder um, that we didn't know. Um, so uh, that was one of our losses. The other one was another interesting, I've never had this happen either. Um, you know, most people say you don't lose flaps, uh, you know, after the first two or three days. She was home um, and I actually saw her in clinic on post-op day six and everything looked great. And she calls the next morning and she had taken some sort of uh, something for her bladder. I don't remember what the medication was, but uh, something uh, uh, vasoactive. And um, she called and she basically had an ischemic flap and it wasn't, it wasn't venous, it was arterial thrombosis and, um, and it was acute ischemia and we brought her back and we went through the motions, but it was already too late by the time we got her to the OR. And I, that's the only flap I've lost, you know, delayed like that. No, it's unusual. Vessels are tiny and that may play into it. Um, so indications for this, uh, you know, generally almost every patient we've done has had a tummy tuck. So 92% of these patients have a surgically uh, absent abdomen. And if you go back to that drawing that I showed early on, how do we pick these patients? Typically, these patients have a truncal, um, I don't want to say excess necessarily, but that's where they they store, uh, you know, a potential donor site. And we're always going to pick it deep first. And so if they have a deep, we'll do that. But if they don't, then they may be thin in their thighs. And that's when the lumbar actually comes in as kind of a, a perfect option. The problem with the lumbar is just like latissimus flaps, you know, they all get, uh, they don't all get seromas, but a significant number gets seromas and the drains stay in forever. Um, so that is one of the things we've noticed. Um, and so we we will put them in garments and tiny. We put all paps in garments also, um, but uh, we'll put them in garments and some of these drains will persist for a month, um, which, uh, you know, nobody likes. So the pedicle, uh, this is not an easy dissection, um, and it's, um, you know, I'll show you some pictures in a little video, but the uh, pedicle basically runs between the rectus spinae and the quadratus uh, lumborum, um, and so we do a dissection uh, from medial uh, to lateral, and we go right down to the vertebral process, um, so it's a very short pedicle. Um, and so again, benefits of the CTA, we CT all of these patients. Um, perforator location, um, that helps you, of course, with marking and planning, and incision planning. And then uh, for me, it tells me how difficult the case is gonna be. Some of these perforators hug the posterior, the, the pelvis. And if it is on the pelvis, uh, I know two things are gonna happen. One, the patient's gonna have a lot more pain because we're gonna be right on the periosteum of the pelvis. And two, I'm gonna have a much harder time doing the flap um, because it's gonna be really stuck and it's gonna be a very tight window dissecting this uh, pedicle down. Um, to get length. Um, and I, I at least like knowing that before surgery. I don't like knowing it at all. I wish it never happened, but uh, does, it does definitely make it harder. Um, so this is a little video uh, that we uh, published uh, relatively recently. Um, and so this was actually our very first lumbar um, flap and we decided to video it and fortunately it worked. Um, so we were able to publish it. Um, but so marking, you know, somewhat everything else. And basically you're feeling uh, the posterior pelvis and the perforator comes right, uh, comes out right over that. Um, and it's about nine centimeters lateral. And then, um, and then so, you know, we fortunately have learned from others experience. The Blonde, Blonde Deals group does these and, um, you know, it's a four centimeter pedicle, which is impossible to work with. So we do these jump graphs from the deep. Um, and like I said, most of these patients have already had a tummy tuck, so the incision's there. So make a small incision and and go down and um, and uh, grab that. It's a jump graph. Uh, we then do this medial to lateral dissection. Um, and once you come over the rectus spinae, you drop into kind of a groove, um, and then you'll find the perforator, which you can kind of see here. You're about to see once I move my hand. Um, there's the perforator. 
the uh, dissection is very tight. Um, it goes in between these muscles, but it's encased in fascia and the fascia can be very uh, rigid. Um, and so we'll dissect that out, we'll go lateral, um, and then we're harvesting the flap here. Uh, you could see just there how short the pedicle actually is. We do progressive tension for closure. Um, I don't like progressive tension otherwise, but we do it here um, because of the seroma rate. We then do microsurgery on the back table. Um, this is while the patient's being flipped. Um, so we're connecting that jump graft uh, to, the, uh, to the lumbar artery flap. Um, and then we'll bring that over to the chest. And so here you can see, well, real quickly, you could see the, um, the pedicle. It's only four centimeters, and our jump grafts are typically about six centimeters. And then, uh, you know, plugging in the chest, like we, like we said, uh, pretty typical uh, micro. Um, and then spy, and looks good. The lumbar is actually shaped incredibly well. Um, you basically just sit it in. And that was me putting my hands up saying, huh, it looks great, um, because it, it just kind of sits in there. Um, and it and uh, very easy to inset actually. And so this is our uh, series. Uh, this was our 30. This paper is actually coming out fairly soon. Um, and so uh, our first 30 of these. Um, and the things I highlight here are that the pedicle length again four centimeters. It's really short. And we'll go right to the uh, to the transverse process, and you can palpate that bone, and we don't go any further. Um, early Early on, I think Blondiel did go further, but they had some neuropraxia, and, and I don't want to mess in that area. And if you get bleeding down in that hole, it's a really tight hole, and it's a mess. Um, so the other thing that I highlight here is the ischemia time is really long. So, uh, you know, it, almost an hour and a half. Um, and uh, what I didn't say, so this is, our first one was a stage surgery. So you notice there was a unilateral. After that, every single one of these has been a simultaneous bilateral reconstruction, which, which does complicate the situation. And I'll kind of go through the flow of that, but it increases ischemia time. Um, and we think potentially increases your revision rate. So per flap, we've got about 27% revision rate. Um, now that's not per anastomosis, right? So there's four anastomosis per flap. Um, so it is, uh, you know, per anastomosis, it's much lower, but that's a lot higher than our revision rate for other things. Um, and I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One, this flap is encased in this fascia. And if you don't release that fascia, then the pedicle doesn't flow well. And we learned very early on, we kept revising flaps and then we started releasing all this adventitia and fascia, and then they started flowing better. So we've stopped revising as quickly. Um, I think the other thing is this ischemia time. That's a pretty long ischemia time. That may play into our uh, revision rate. And so our flow, we start, as you saw in that, that uh, video, we start on the chest, we start on the tummy. We then close the tummy, we staple the chest, we flip. We harvest both flaps. So typically I, I'm on one side, Tiosh is on the other. We will uh, prepare both, I should say. We don't fully harvest. We harvest one, that one goes to the back table and micro begins on the back table. We close rapidly that one side. We harvest the other one as soon as we're done closing. It goes to the back table. We close the other side. We flip the patient. Micro is happening on the second flap by now. The first flap then goes to the chest and is being plugged in. And when that's done, the second flap comes up and is plugged in. So the sequencing has to work out well. And, um, and that's obviously why we have uh, you know, a higher uh, ischemia time. And I think why we have more revisions. Um, but we'll see. Um, and so here you see see that exact kind of flow. Uh, we've harvested both. We've closed the abdomen. You see our jump grafts. Uh, we flip over, um, dissecting out the uh, flap. And, um, and now we've harvested, connected. And here it is on the table inset. Like I said, you basically just sit it in there and she, she looks pretty good. And so this is without any revisions. Uh, abdomen could certainly be improved and you could probably improve the breast a little, little bit, um, but uh, but pretty reasonable. And like I said, you just set this flap in there and it really contours very well. Um, scar, we're still kind of working with. It does end up a little bit higher than we would like. Um, but if you look at the contour, there's some debate. Um, are we just hollowing out the flank and the lower back and that makes the buttock almost look augmented or are we lifting the buttock? Um, maybe a combination of both. Um, but you can certainly see that in that photo. Uh, another one of these, um, you know, post-op, uh, uh, good result. Um, and so here, same thing with the buttock. You can see it looks a little more round uh, on the pre-op. You can see it's almost kind of this, uh, you know, shape here, and then now it's more round. Um, so I don't know. I mean, most people are tolerating the higher scar. 
Um, so that's kind of laps. And then we're going to finish uh, quickly with just uh, when one flap isn't enough. So about 20% of our practice is multi-flaps, which is pretty, pretty high uh, percentage. And uh, again, this goes back to kind of what can you compromise on? And you cannot compromise on skin um, for sure. And, and footprint is kind of debatable. And so uh, we've looked at this and certainly uh, there's criticism when you start talking about doing all these stack flaps and is it safe? And that's kind of the big question. And so in our series, uh, about uh, most of our uh, double flaps or most of our stack flaps are double deeps. Um, and then about 30% of them are four flaps or, or double uh, bilateral uh, stack flaps. Um, and then uh, stack paps is um, a smaller number. And so certainly, uh, as you would expect, uh, BMI is going to be lower in our stack flaps, procedure time is longer, and the flap weight is going to be less because these are, you know, we don't just do these and we don't need to. So we only do them when, when we need the volume. One of the biggest things is, uh, you know, the DVT rate is higher. So we're much more likely to uh, give these patients um, uh, low Vinox to go home with. One of the critical things with any time you're thinking about stack flap is your recipient side vessels. So uh, internal mammary uh, is certainly our first choice. Uh, if y'all haven't watched this video, um, at least our residents thinks it, think it is helpful. And when you're doing a stack flap, you really do have to open up the chest quite a bit. Uh, I'm not gonna show the video, but it's certainly available uh, in PRS. Um, and then so, uh, you know, we looked at this again, this has certainly been discussed many times, um, but we kind of felt like caudal was more of a problem. Um, so cranial and caudal are your two kind of recipient sites, and the other option is an intra-flap, um, you know, side branch of either a deep or a pap, typically. And, you know, generally speaking, it's, at least statistically, there's no difference, um, but still, I think we, you know, we have more problems with caudal, um, but you just have to be mindful and really pick the best vessel. So it's a case-by-case -case, uh, um, uh, specific. So the times that I'm, I get worried about caudal is, you know, left radiated maybe infection from a previous implant or expander um, and you know those are kind of the bigger big problems uh, right tends to be pretty forgiving um, certainly bigger um, you know the other thing is uh, you know the we're the our own worst enemy um, so we've become known uh, certainly regionally for for pops and and for kind of a salvaging failed recon so you get these patients that have already had failed deeps and we have to do double paps and uh, you know, when you have a failed deep, memory is uh, less than ideal to go back to. So we tend to go into the uh, subscapular system and we'll use the serratus plus the thoracal dorsal or a side branch of PAP. And again, one of the, uh, go back to the theme, uh, co-surgery is key and communication is key. And we're constantly talking. And, and so if I'm dissecting out a PAP and I see a high uh, branch, I'm talking to T. Yosha, who's up in the subscapular system saying, look, we might have a branch here, uh, you know, as a recipient site. And so there's a lot of back and forth. Um, another theme, CTA, we love CTAs uh, because it helps us plan. And so same thing, double deeps. Uh, we use the CTA to, to know, are we going to need to go coddle? Or are we going to have a, a branch that we can plug, to, plug into on the abdomen? Um, so we typically know that before surgery. And so this is a patient um, that was referred uh, to us from outside, previous implant radiation uh, loss, um, and then kind of this draining sinus that you can't see that well. She's incredibly thin, BMI 22, and you wouldn't think that a deep would be ideal, but she really needs a lot of skin, and the uh, double deep is what gives you the most skin. Um, and so that's that's what we decided to do. Um, and so you can kind of see if we're thinking about deeps, that's what we need. We need volume up top, and we need skin down below plus volume down below, and that's what the tummy gives. Only a 420 gram flap, but um, enough to match her other side, and, and certainly a, a reasonable result. A very thin patient that we had to replace that lower half of the breast. Um, uh, another patient, um, thin and, you know, again, a uh, large resection of skin, um, so uh, double deep. Um, and then so, again, this is kind of what I was just talking about with uh, staged uh, flaps uh, for failure. So we certainly do that. Um, and then uh, we do a number of uh, double paps for some of these thinner patients. This patient wanted um, wanted an augmentation basically, and she's a perfect implant candidate. So I actually tried to, I almost never try and talk people into implants, but um, we did an expander on her left um, and she looked great. She would have done exceptionally well if we just did an uh, implant on the right and an implant on the left, but she didn't want that. And she's, uh, you know, 43, so she really wanted autologous. And so we did some fat grafting on the right side. So this is her with her expander, um, double paps, um, it was kind of one of these situations where it was either going to be double pass, going to be too much. So we had to do something on the left, but one pack wouldn't be enough. 
Um, and I think we plugged into a side branch, so you can barely see that there. And so here she is, uh, post-op, 210 cc's uh, fat grafting to the right, and then uh, 400 uh, total grams uh, for left breast reconstruction, and then uh, reasonably good uh, result for her, and uh, scar is incredibly well hidden um, in her. Um, when you do a double pap, you don't have to push the donor site quite as much, so you can often get a donor, a donor result, kind of like what I just showed. Um, this patient, incredibly thin, double uh, deep, probably not really an option in her. So we did immediate double pap. She was going to have a, a pretty large skin resection. So we did this kind of double uh, skin paddle. Um, and, you know, with time, it fades and, and whatnot. Again, you can't you can't sacrifice on skin. She needed a lot of skin. So, so you just have to expose skin. Um, and so four flaps, uh, you know, we do a decent number of these. We've done deeps and paps, deeps and laps, which is probably the one operation that when I walk in in the morning, I want to turn around and go home because it's a beating. Um, and we've done laps and paps. Don't do that many of these four flaps with laps, um, but it is something we've done. This was our very first four flap, uh, 2014, I think. Um, you know, BMI 23, relatively thin. She's had right radiation, completely flat. Uh, a previous D-cup breast, so she wants to get back to kind of where she was. Tummy's not enough, thighs aren't enough. Um, we need to replace that lower half of the skin. We need to give her volume up top. Um, and so here's kind of what we planned, uh, deep in thighs. And uh, here she is on the table. Uh, thighs were plugged in cranially. The pap actually rounds very well to match the uh, IMF, and then the deep varies very well. Uh, to match the upper portion of the breast, if you think about the, the shaping of both of these flaps. Um, and so here's her uh, post-op result. Um, and, you know, I, I can't think of another way to get that result other than doing a fourth flap. Uh, another patient, uh, so I placed her expanders, uh, and then she had radiation, and uh, her expanders were submuscular. We have less of an issue with this now, but certainly tightened up quite a bit uh, post-radiation. Again, uh, she had fairly large breasts preoperatively and a uh, deficient abdomen in comparison. So we did the same thing um, where we took uh, abdomen and thighs and we need to lower it. We need to give her skin for that lower right. And then again, so if you think about the shape of the path of the deep, you see them right there on the uh, patient's right breast. Um, I showed this to patients one time. I do not recommend that. Um, there were gasps in the audience um, when they saw all the incisions. Um, so stay away from not if you do four flaps, but uh, so here she is on the table. So total weight is about 600 grams, uh, maybe 700 grams um, when you combine the flaps. Uh, typical deep, typical pap. Um, you know, again, both both plugged in and and kind of the result uh, post operatively for her. Her nipples have faded a little bit, but um, an acceptable donor sites. And so uh, one of the questions is often, you know, how do you do this? What's the flow? And so we did one of these in the last uh, two weeks two weeks ago. And so this is uh, kind of our schematic and it's it's kind of a, you know, pointillism photo or, or something with, uh, you know, little specks of uh, color everywhere. Um, but the key is, is, you know, you have someone in charge uh, or two people in charge that are keeping flow going constantly and keeping the case going and people are working all the time. So it's a, it's a um, five member team in this operation. Uh, we've done it with three members um, and finished in similar time, but it's just uh, depends on who the team members are and, and what you're doing. Um, and so you can see we're just all over the place uh, in the sense I'm, again, I'm green. So I, I'm in the rib and then I'm doing a pap and then I'm uh, jumping and doing the other pap and then I'm finishing one of the ribs and I'm doing some micro and then I'm, you know, in setting and then I'm closing the tummy and, and, and you know, it, it's kind of all over the place. Um, and, you know, six and a half hours for, uh, for a, uh, a four flap is pretty reasonable. That is not uh, what it always is. Um, but, um, but we have gotten closer to that time and, and that is more common. And I think we've had our, one of our early ones was like a 14 hour operation. So uh, we certainly didn't start that way, but a learning curve as with anything. Um, and so more recently, uh, we decided to torture ourselves um, by a patient like this. Uh, so she's radiated on the right, large breast before, that's natural. She does not have implants. Um, so she wants to, you know, be sizable post. Um, her thighs are actually very thin and her tummy is not that big, but she had pretty good lumbar. Um, so we decided to do a circumferential approach. And we, uh, so using her abdomen and her and her uh, lumbar, and this is just a beating, as you can think about moving around and flipping a patient, all that. But we got a lot of volume, and she's got a great 
result. And um, like I said, I don't like doing operation, but it certainly works. And I don't know how else for this patient we could have gotten that. And that's an on-the-table result. Um, with COVID, we don't have uh, longer-term results yet. Um, there's another uh, patient, uh, same operation, uh, staged uh, follow-up here. You can see kind of our planning in the sense of, I mentioned earlier, the uh, vertical approach and kind of thinking through the, you know, our, at the time of FLAP, we're not necessarily getting the final result in some patients, but but we have a plan and we know where we're going. And so you can see that here, and then you see her final result, and um, pretty pretty good result, uh, you know, considering especially. And so that's a, a deep and a lumbar. Um, and so going around again, the scar is a little bit high, and I, I don't know how we solve that problem, but um, we continue to evolve. So uh, sorry, I know I went over; it's a lot of information, but that's kind of. Uh, that's that's my world over the last eight years and how I view kind of this uh, process and breast reconstruction and um, and such. So, so happy to answer questions or. Uh, Nick, thank you so much for an incredible talk. Really a a, a tour de force uh, in microsurgical yeah. breast reconstruction. Uh, incredibly impressive, and I think uh, that was evident in, by the fact that we had almost 90 people at one point um, from around the yeah. world. Uh, joining to to be educated. So thank you, uh, thank you so much for that. There are a lot of questions. I'll try to get to some of them, and I want to be respectful of your time as well. But I think um, you showed such great stuff that everyone wants to learn more. Um, so the the first is is a comment, and then which which will lead to a question. I think one of the things that um, struck me when I first heard your talk last year at the Penn Lab course was a sufficiency concept and, and using the, you know, the, the multi-team approach. And I think we, uh, we certainly agree with that. And this is exactly how we do things. We have the same team every day. We, same scrub techs and scrim, same nurses. And, and we're, there's always someone driving the case. And with any free flap, there's always two attendings involved with multiple trainees. Um, the question there is, and, and um, could I have my own answer, but from a fellow or a trainee standpoint, um, when these systems are so efficient, um, it's sometimes difficult to know why they're so efficient. And it's only when you do your own cases and then compare it to the efficient model that you figure out the steps that you could be doing better. And we hear this from our fellows, for example, uh, because they actually do do some of their own uh, hand trauma yeah. cases. Um, and then they say, you know what, I, I was trying to do this case and, and I was trying to figure out why it was a struggle. Um, but then the next time they do it with you. So in your practice model, um, is does Parkland, for example, provide that kind of experience for residents to do stuff on their own and then really see the delta between them and you? Yeah, no question. Um, so that's uh, it's really somewhat exactly how it happens. Um, you most people that get involved in these cases are a fourth year or above, right? So yeah. um, you know when you look at the people that I had in those diagrams, um, it's usually the standard OR. If in a normal situation is going to be me and Teosha and either a fellow or a chief resident and then maybe a fourth year. Um, and so they're involved in this whole thing. And, you know, I didn't point it out, but in that day, when I showed the full day that we did on Tuesday, if, it, uh, if I went back to it, um, you could see that my, the second case, the second flap we did, um, I, I, actually did nothing on the deep and Teosha only was involved in deep dissection for like 10 minutes. So, and that's, now it doesn't mean we're not there and we're certainly there and we're, you know, supervising and, and whatnot, but, um, but they're getting autonomy right then within, even in our private, you know, practice. Now it, it's a very controlled autonomy, um, but, you know, and, and again, that depends on the team and to your, to your question, this same team we've been working with and we've been kind of doing these efficiency uh, kind of uh, models and looking at everything over the last, uh, you know, two, three weeks. Um, and the uh, 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 we were comfortable with the team and they've kind of watched us kind of power through and work together with us powering through. And then we we're like, OK, you guys, you know, get after it. And the time didn't change. Right. Um, so they were able to do that. And yes, Parkland. So our typical chief rotations, they actually rotate with us first and then they go to Parkland immediately afterwards. So um, so they get to kind of see how, you know, I, I don't like to say it this way, but to see kind of how it's supposed to be done, if, if you will, right. and then go over there and then kind of figure it out. And then there's certainly the opportunity to then circle back around and come and, and get involved. 
Yeah, no, I think um, especially when you're doing these multi-flap cases, I mean, the 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 deep plus uh, lumbar flaps, I think that's, uh, you know, bilateral. Those are <laughs> definitely... Yeah, I, I um, that on issue. <clears throat> so first, the technical question with that, then more of a philosophical question. So when you're doing the deep flaps and you do the, the lumbar flaps, what are you using for your interposition vein grafts? Because uh, you're presumably using the deep inferior epigastrics for that case. Yeah, so we're still doing... Uh, we, so the way that case works is we still use a deep jump graph. And what we literally do is, again, we prepare the chest. We dissect our deeps out just like we normally would, but we maintain cranial blood flow. So instead of clipping anything going cranial, that is still supported. We clip down pretty low into the groin and we take, you know, a short jump graph with the deep still perfused from the, the superior system. Um, okay. We then staple flip and, and move on. I see. Got it. Okay. Um, and then the other question um, that was more of a, a philosophical one is, do you lose any sleep at night when you have four fresh flaps in a patient? Uh, you, you know, the good news is no. Um, so, because it's, it's become pretty common um, because we do, we do two bilaterals, you know, many times on a Tuesday and Wednesday. And uh, a couple of good things, we have, we have a great team and, and we don't have that many take backs. Um, and we have a very quick system to get patients back into the OR if need be. And I live 10 minutes from the hospital. So the truth is the second that we're done, I'm out the door. I don't care if worst case scenario, I can be back in 10 minutes. You know, it's not that big of a deal. So I, I think that's critical, you know, back to my point of, you know, microsurgery career, you, you know, you have to be comfortable that if you're going home and not sleeping and worrying about things, then. Yeah. you're not going to last very long so for the trainees i mean you got to figure out how to how to manage that so i i don't i don't think twice about it anymore yeah and i think i think the the same is true and you know most of our practices extremity trauma and replantation and i think um the longevity part of it if, if it's taken you five hours to put a single a single digit back on it, it's just yeah. not going to be a something you could do for a long time um the um the software that you were showing with the with the time uh management can you tell us a little bit about that? There were a couple of questions about what software you use um, and who's doing the tracking. It looks a little bit like our good friend Evan Garfine's Six Sigma um, yeah. kind of platform, but tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so so I know Garfine well, we're good friends. Um, and so, it, you know, I should credit him because uh, I've talked to him many times about process and it's it's how we approach things anyways, but he's certainly with, with Sigma and all that um, as, has made us think more about it. Now, I wish I could say that that was a streamlined process. Um, it is not, that is Excel. So that is as simple ah. as putting that in time and it's painful. Um, part of the reason why we've been able to do it right now is purely because of COVID. Um, Cause we aren't as busy as we would be right. outside of COVID. And we aren't doing as many flaps, you know, two flaps on the same day right now. Um, but yeah. Because, you know, I said we're back up and running. We are, but we're not, you know, we're, we're not like killing it like we would be on some other days potentially. So um, it, we have more time and in the OR, um, it depends on who we get. We have, we have one circulator and one scrub that are absolutely fantastic and we love them and I wish I could work with them every day. And she will literally mark it all out and she will mark all the times for us. If she's not in there or if either of them are not in there, then it's a lot of communication and we're doing it ourselves and you know kind of each person is marking their times for their individual steps and then it's and then you know i hate to say it but and then i physically am putting it into excel and creating those diagrams well that's it's a lot more uh, time intensive than i, than I thought it was going to be uh, so congratulations yeah. on, on on the fortitude for that <laughs> I think um, just uh, to, to give a shout out to our dear friend, Evan Garfine. Um, so for those who aren't familiar with him, Evan is the chief of plastic surgery at um, Montefiore Einstein uh, in New York City. And uh, he has a company that's actually trying to essentially do what Dr. Haddock has shown as far as trying to identify points of efficiencies and specifically points where things are not as efficient and comparing it to a system that is efficient to try to help surgeons shave off time in areas of, the, of, of parts of the operation that um, they that they can and so what he would do for example is he would uh, follow somebody like dr haddock um, who has an efficient system and then have somebody else who's trying to become efficient and trying to have the software identify points that they can do that so we, we look forward to kind of following the progress of that company as well 
Um, because I think, uh, Nick, just looking at your talk, obviously, there are very, very few people out there and systems out there who are able to do these cases, these fairly complex cases with many flaps, as efficiently as you guys are doing it. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Great. Um, and so I think I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up there. I wanted to, to, to thank Dr. Haddock for joining us again and, and for really giving us a phenomenal uh, breast reconstruction talk. I want to thank everyone from around the world for joining us in our series. Um, our series will continue uh, to this afternoon at 4 p.m. Pacific time. We have Professor Ming-Wei Cheng uh, from Changgung Memorial Hospital discussing his approach to the treatment of lymphedema. And we're also working on having Dr. Haddock's partner, Sumit Teoshia, who he mentioned um, as, as, as uh, the person involved in many of these studies, um, hopefully give us a talk in the next couple of weeks. So please stay tuned for that. Thanks again, Nick. Bert, thank you. Good to see you. Yeah, same here. Have a great weekend, okay? You too. Okay, bye.